interview and job search strategies that work. I have a very special guest today. His name is Gary Rada. Gary, why don't you tell us about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Good afternoon, Gary. So as, uh, as you mentioned, my name is Gary Rada, and I've spent the last nine years in the IT infrastructure and cybersecurity uh, consulting and staffing field, uh, specializing in areas uh, from network engineering, uh, systems engineering, cloud and data, uh, cybersecurity, information security, and, and really everything uh, from a technological standpoint that touches uh, an IT infrastructure, which is, of course, as you know, everywhere. If, you, if you're a business, if you're an entity, you have infrastructure. So it's a big umbrella, um, focusing predominantly on the, the senior level uh, side of uh, the house, but um, certainly uh, dealt my fair share with uh, folks just coming into the field, uh, folks with a handful of years of experience, and uh, as well as you know, people at the end of their career as well. Oh, awesome. Uh, so I have a couple questions for you. So um, put you on the spot here a little bit. Um, so, sometimes I apply for jobs, right, for instance, or, or whatnot, or friends. I have friends who apply for jobs. And it's, it's always, you know, understanding the process. So um, can, you, can you tell me, like, why do, I, why do I need to wait? Why do I need to wait? Why do I wait so long to hear back from recruiters? Um, what, what's, the, what's the reasoning behind that, do you think? That's a general question, but can you answer that maybe? I can, and, and it's a great question because over the last nine years, it's something that I, I heard on a, on a daily basis. Uh, in fact, I think uh, once upon a time in one of our earlier conversations, uh, one of our earliest conversations, actually, that was a question you had asked me at that time as well. And the answer uh, I wish was a, a simple uh, one size fits all answers all questions, but it doesn't. And what I've learned in my experience, Gary, is that <sighs> there isn't a whole lot of transparency in the IT staff in just the staffing world as a whole. Um, and, and what I've come to find to be true more times than not is a lot of times you'll get a phone call from a recruiter about a position, but what you don't know about that position at the time is that that business might not have been awarded officially, um, that that budget may not have been approved. All of the necessary uh, key individuals who need to approve a position aren't necessarily involved. Um, and so while the intent is pure and uh, the interest is real um, the process the red tape the bureaucracy if you will uh, can simply and most often is the reason for the slow response time um, it could be a breakdown in, in efficiency or a, a, a total inefficiency of that individual recruiter or consulting firm that you might be communicating with as far as uh, simply having poor follow-up um, or perhaps just Poor communication between the client and the staffing company uh, is another commonality or uh, familiar trend that I've come to find. Um, and also, of course, uh, while it isn't just these three reasons, uh, the reality, too, is that there are thousands of recruiters out there, offshore and domestic, who will call a consultant about a position that they filled a month ago. They filled two months ago. And sometimes they simply made it up. And But they want to talk to you because they do what you, you might call resume farming. I used to call it resume stacking. And simply they want to be able to go to a prospective client somewhere down the road and say, look at all these people we have. When in reality, there's no relationship there. There's no real interest because there's never really a real position in the first place. So there's a lot of different avenues we could go down as to the whys you might, it might take so long or why you might never hear back. But um, usually it comes from a real place, but unfortunately the industry is mired with a lot of really dishonest practice. Ah, I see. So how, how does, how does the recruiter find a candidate? You know, is it just job boards? Is there, is that primarily it? I mean, can you talk on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, Gary, I believe that skillful, sustainable recruiting is an art form. Um, and, 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 and I'll qualify that. So 
you can train a monkey to dial a phone. There's no art in dialing the phone. There's no skill in dialing a, a phone. Uh, anybody who who dials their phone two, three, four, five hundred times a day, good for you. That's not a talent. Okay, that just means your energy is focused in every single direction, and you're not an expert at anything. Um, where the best place for me, and what allowed me to have not only have a nine-year career, but a successful nine-year career is is you develop your clientele from your existing clientele. If you're doing a good job of building relationships and showing value and, and having integrity, meaning being where you say you're going to be doing what you say you're going to do, then people want to work with you and people want to you to work with the people that they know because they can vouch for you and they believe in you. So for me, that was always my biggest source. I, you know, in, in, in 25, excuse me, in, uh, in nine years, um, I, I looked this up recently in anticipation of our conversation. And in that period of time, I had communicated or at one time or another worked with a little over 2,600 people. Wow. And while, of course, I couldn't possibly maintain a, a clientele or a database of 2,600 people uh, on a monthly or even an annual basis, you could never hope to talk to that many people at least once every year. It's just not real. Um, one thing that's true is that about 70% of that 2,600 were referral based. Um, I, I spent very little time uh, developing on LinkedIn. In fact, I, I typically received more requests than I ever sent um, because that's where every recruiter is. Um, I spent very little time. I, I never had a monster account. I never had an Indeed account. I never had a Dice account because Again, there's no relationship building in that. That's just keyword searching, and you're just hoping to get lucky, you know, with some good timing. And don't get me wrong, luck is important, and luck is a factor, absolutely. But for me, I did the best that I could to try to develop a clientele through quality relationship building. Um, and yeah, you know, I would find folks on on the internet, on LinkedIn, from time to time, as I needed to, or as a particularly you know difficult skill or unique location came up and I didn't know anyone in those areas, I certainly wasn't above it. Uh, it's just not sustainable. And so for me, word of mouth networking was always the most effective way. Okay. Um, that's, oh, that's great. <laughs> that's great insight, actually. Um, that, wow, 2,600. That's, that's amazing. That's amazing. I don't think I know 2,600 people, actually. So that's, uh, wow. <laughs> um, how does how does a recruiter get paid? Why, why do companies actually hire recruiters when they already have? It, is it that hard? I mean, I'm just curious. I don't I don't know. So, um, how how does a recruiter get paid? Um, and again, uh, why do companies hire recruiters? Sure, sure. So, the question. Oh, it's um, could be hot, you know. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm the, the so that it's 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 as simple as it is complicated, right? So the simplicity of it is they hire it because uh, to be to use frank language, human resources departments at even your best companies in the world don't have a damn clue on how to qualify an individual or know what a qualified individual looks like or sounds like when you talk to them, when you start getting into the technical um, nuts and bolts of IT. Um, they are excellent at hiring other internal staff, um, you know, uh, other people to work within the back office, administrative positions, legal even, you know, uh, all kinds of different, uh, you know, management leadership roles, et cetera. But when it comes to like the minutia, when it comes to getting super granular, and you're trying to qualify somebody for a, a high level technical position that requires high level technical knowledge. Um, you know, like I said, anybody can match buzzwords to a resume and, you know, eventually you'll strike gold if you just try enough times, just the, the law of large numbers, the law of averages, it's going to happen. But if you, when you need a specialized person, you need a specialized person to find them and HR company or HR groups within organizations simply don't, have the capacity, the time, uh, or really, honestly, the interest at training their in internal staff to to 
you know, really immerse themselves within a, a specific skill or industry and, and know it well enough that you can talk about it and talk to the people where that's their livelihood. Um, so they hire recruiters for that reason. And, and how do recruiters get paid was your other question. So what I could tell you with my experience, and, and I can talk to you about how that compares to um, other other uh, firms or not not by name, of course, but uh, other other examples that I know of in the industry. So for me, um, I was paid a base salary just for walking in the door and showing up every day. No, you know, that might have been a great base salary if you were just walking out of college and that's your first job. But for an established person, you know, with bills to pay and mortgages and stuff like that, it it, it wasn't going to be enough. So uh, essentially my structure was, uh, you know, base salary and commission. So commission was based on hours worked by the consultant. So, you know, I know at one time I said to you, Hey man, if, if, if I don't have you on a project and you're not working, I'm not making money because that was absolutely true. Um, so I happen to like the structure that I operated under because that meant that I was always vested in trying to find work for everybody that I was working with because if I wanted to make more money, I needed to make sure that you were making more money. And more importantly, it was important for me to try to make sure that I was matching you to the right position because I don't want to put you on a job where two, three, four weeks later you decide to quit because it really wasn't a good fit. I want to put you on a job. More importantly, I want to see you finish that job because the longer you work, the longer I get paid. So, and of course, that was based off of a percentage of basically what was left after all the bills are paid and, you know, the consultant was paid and whatnot. So it wasn't some large sum by any means. Nobody is retiring off of one uh, contractor place. I'll promise you that. Um, but other industries charge a kind of like a flat fee, right? Almost like a finder's fee. Um, you know, uh, there are other uh, vendors out there, uh, staffing agencies out there that charge people like yourself or others within the space essentially like a representation fee. All right, pay us $1,500 and we'll help you find a job. Well, personally, I don't believe in getting, I don't believe in paying for any service that hasn't been rendered yet. I don't know why anybody would ever agree to pay somebody to find them a job. I really don't. You know, I, you don't pay a mechanic to work on your car before he starts turning a wrench. Why would you pay a recruiter or a staffing agency before they've done their job? So I would, uh, at the end of the day, what was important to me was that you were getting, or that my consultants were getting what they asked for. If my consultant said, hey, I need $100 an hour, then my job was to find them a, an appropriate position that could satisfy that need. If I was, whatever I was getting paid or whatever my agency was getting paid as a result of getting you that $100 an hour, as far as I was concerned, wholly irrelevant. Because you were getting everything that you asked for and you, you're, you should be hopefully, ideally, satisfied in both your position and in your compensation. So, um, you know, I, I would advise anybody who's in the IT, you know, staffing space, get to know your recruiter, you know, understand their business model, you know, also understand that they're probably not going to want to tell you every intricate detail, but then again, ask yourself, do I need to know that? But form a relationship, you know, work with people that you like talking to. Work with people that seem like they're working hard for you, and you know that's a good relationship. And, and I'll promise you, you'll always have a pipeline of opportunities coming your way when you can find a recruiter that you have who, who works under a good structure that incentivizes them to get you working. I think that's a perfectly approach or perfectly acceptable thing to ask: is are how are you compensated, and are you compensated for putting me to work? Because if that's their structure and you like talking to them and they seem diligent and hardworking, work with them. If that's not their structure and you don't know how your employment benefits or does not benefit them, you know, then maybe that's not the right partner for you either. Oh, that's great. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's uh, oh, some good insights. Um, that, yeah, that's uh. You spell it out like um, a strategy, you know, almost like a, uh, it's a personal thing, right? Is what you, you mentioned. Um, you know, I just want to well, ask. It should be. I, I just, 
sorry about that. I, I just want to ask one more question, right? Um, yeah. I've, I've talked to hundreds of recruiters, like more than probably more than a thousand. I've been on probably 500 interviews in my life, something like that. Anyway. Um, and I know the role. I mean, I know the, I know how it works every time basically, but a lot of people don't actually. So, um, tell, tell people like, okay, how they can help the candidate can help the recruiter get them a job. Like, um, you know, something like I, what I tell recruiters is I tell them like, this is what I want to get paid. I tell them up front, like everything as a candidate, like, this is what I want. And versus, cause I've tried the other strategy, like, okay, you, you know, I don't know what I want. Right. <laughs> so maybe you could tell a little bit about like how, a, so basically the idea is like, um, um, you know, lower the competition, you know, like weed out the competition for me. So I'm the candidate. I need the job. Recruiter needs, you know, to hire uh, to get me employed. But more importantly, I'm the candidate. I need the job. So how can I help the recruiter as a candidate get, you know, get, um, get me a job basically? What, what do I need to, what kind of things like, okay, little tips and tricks. Sure. Sure. So that's a, that's a fantastic question. And, and, and frankly, I think the folks that, that best understand uh, what we're talking about now and are about to discuss are the ones that, that really don't struggle to find work. They stay consistently working and they find more job satisfaction. So first and foremost, and, and this really is, I couldn't emphasize the importance of this any greater, but understand that the relationship between yourself and the recruiter is a partnership. You do not work for them. They do not work for you. You guys work together. You have a common goal and you need to work together to achieve that common goal. Now, obviously, as we talked about earlier, recruiters come in all shapes and sizes. You generally know a good recruiter when you meet one because you've talked to 500 that weren't. And so you can generally spot a good one when you, when you're on the phone or when you meet them in person and you know, you know, that's a good sign. Hold on to that. Um, and I'm certainly would never advocate just pouring out every piece of data that any recruiter ever asked for you for to every recruiter who calls you because you also don't want to dilute your value. Right. So understand where you are, but understand behind the scenes, what that recruiter, what a good recruiter is doing for you at no cost to them, excuse me, at no cost to you, the consultant, to try and find you work, that a good recruiter is providing resume feedback on perhaps on format or content or, hey, listen, this position is emphasizing this, you know, I don't see a whole lot of that on your resume, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about what you did, can you provide greater detail, I don't want the manager to dismiss you out of hand simply because he or she doesn't see that particular buzzword or experience on your resume. So somebody that's going to reach out to you and say, Hey, I'm seeing some gaps here. And I think that could hold us back. What can we do to, what can we do to highlight the experience that you have? You know, that's somebody who's showing a vested interest in wanting to make sure that you at least get on the phone in the first place where you will have a chance to do your thing. Right? So the recruiter's job is just to get you on the phone. Right. I like to say, and I've said it for years, that my job as your recruiter is to get you the interview. Your job is to get the job. Right. Yeah. So understanding the, the your role in the relationship is also important. You know, if you interview for a job, you might feel like you crushed the interview. The manager might feel differently. You might walk away from an interview say, feeling a little deflated, like, yeah, that didn't go so well. And you end up getting the job. So sometimes they're just impossible to read, but understand that that recruiter is going through the same emotional peaks and valleys in that process as you are. And so when you don't get the job, that recruiter also didn't get the job. When you get the job and you're succeeding, that recruiter is also by proxy enjoying that success along with you. So you win and lose, but you do it together. And so just more than anything else. And I, I, I'm, I'm kind of ranting on this, but I, it's because I really believe it, Gary. Form a relationship and understand that it's a partnership and treat them like a peer, okay? Uh -huh. um, a recruiter who might have two years in the business but is working really hard 
and a person, you know, like yourself that might have 18, 20 years, um, I can't tell you the number of times when I was starting in my career that I accepted people talking down to me Ooh. because of the position that I served and the position that they were in. And I allowed that for years until I got to the point in my career where I didn't need your business. I just didn't need you. You needed me more than I needed you. All right. And so eventually you understood what you will and won't endure and what is and isn't necessary. And for consultants, it's the same thing. You know, don't work with a recruiter who, who doesn't show you the time of day, who doesn't call you every month, who doesn't check in on you, who doesn't stay on top of what's changing in your world personally and professionally. You know, at the end of the day, you're, you're going to become a friend of this person. If they're doing a good job, this is somebody that you're going to know, not just work with. So keep that mentality and, and you will always have a job. Um, you know, that, that would be the, if there was any one thing that I would hope folks can take away from this today is, is to just really, really embrace the relationship aspect and the partnership aspect, because every single thing about your experience as a consultant and dealing with recruiters will be immediately and immensely enhanced to your benefit. If you simply embrace that fact and that reality. Mm, that's, that's good. I could probably take some of that advice too, actually. <laughs> so you, you speak, you know, cause I know there's been some times when I talk to recruiters and like, oh, come on, dude. I always, I usually ask them like, um, who's your end client, right? I know they probably don't like to give that information up, but it's like, if it's the same role in the same city, I'm like, I've gotten like a hundred or whatever, 10 calls, not a hundred, let's say 10 calls. Like, oh, is your client such and such? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and then the, the, <laughs> this, this is, <laughs> this for another podcast, I guess, but um, yeah, that's good. That's uh good information. Yeah. So I think, uh, think you know, and, that. And, what's and, that? And be honest. Uh, one, one last thing, one last thing, be, be honest with your recruiter as well. Um, I, and, and, and I'll qualify that real quick by saying I built my career by cutting immediately to the chase with everybody when it came to raid, because yes, location is important. Duration is important. The content of the job, of course, all of those things are factors, but first and foremost, understand that a good recruiter is probably not calling you if they don't at least think the compensation is worth the conversation. Okay. Ooh. So, you know, you know, Hey, you know, Gary, I, I know you mentioned that you really weren't interested in a position in Texas, but I, I had to call because at one point or another, you told me that you were, you really were interested in breaking into the oil and gas industry. And not only that, I have an opportunity like that. And furthermore, this client is offering a rate that's $15 an hour above the highest that you've ever told me you've earned. So I know the location is not ideal, but I think these two other factors are worth talking about, right? And if you're a good recruiter, you know those things about somebody because you've asked them, right? So for me, I would always call and I would say, hey, Gary, I've got this opportunity. I'm just going to cut to the chase with you. It's about 5 to $7 an hour less than you told me that you're looking for. But it's, you know, it's, it's 10 minutes from your front door or, you know, you can work from home, you know. So I thought, hey, at, at minimum, it, it's at least worth a conversation. So I always just cut straight to the chase. This is the best I can do. It either works for you or it doesn't. But this way, when we end the conversation, we're on an even plane and you understand exactly what can and can't be done. And you can make an informed decision based on the facts, not based on, you know, a company who's or a recruiter who's, who's trying to shortchange you five or 10 bucks an hour just so, you know, he or she can make an extra, you know, 30 bucks a week. I, I couldn't care less about $30 a week. So, you know, for me, it was more important that you got the, the compensation you wanted because then that was going to increase the probability that you were going to finish that job and work with me on the next one. So be honest with your recruiter. Hey, I'm really, I'm targeting a hundred dollars an hour in truth. You know, uh, at the low end, I'd be willing to work for, you know, anywhere from 88 to 90, but you know, the positions that are going to be uh, the most appealing to me right now are a hundred bucks an hour. And then a good recruiter is going to say, so you've never made more than $90 an hour, but you think you're worth a hundred now. Did you recently get some new certifications or experience that justify that? Right? Because, and that's not your recruiter being a dick. 
that's your recruiter saying, help me justify this when I tell the client Ooh. that you're, you're worth $100 an hour. Help me explain that for you, oh, right? Good so, you know, because at the end of the day, the recruiter's job is to sell you to the client to get on the phone for the interview. And then when, if I convince Mr. Manager or Ms. Manager that you're worth 100 bucks an hour because you say you are, and then I put you on the phone and you don't, interview like a hundred dollar an hour person well we both lost credibility ah, so I if see. you're not really a hundred dollar an hour person don't don't position yourself as a hundred dollar an hour person you know if one client one time paid you a hundred dollars an hour you're not a one hundred dollar an hour guy you just found a great opportunity one time you know so i, I think it's important to keep everything in perspective because I have found that the even the most elite, elite senior level resources in the IT infrastructure, IT infrastructure space are almost never the highest charging independent consultants. They charge a fair price for their experience and their knowledge, and that is why they never struggle to find work. It's the ones that overinflate their value because you know they bought a they paid fifteen hundred dollars, or, or you know, twenty five hundred dollars, or five thousand dollars to get a an industry certification, and to them, that that means that that means that they're now charging that much more to an end client. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that that doesn't ever apply because it does. But you know, you're worth what somebody's willing to pay for you. And for a client like in a busy market like a Houston or a New York or a Chicago and L.A. Listen, man, you can throw a rock and hit five more people like you. So, and in a crowded market like that, it all comes down to competition on rate. So those clients are looking to pay a staffing company as little as possible because there's so much competition and they're looking to pay the contractors as little as possible because it's the only way the staffing company can place you and actually keep the lights on. So understand where the job is and that a job that's outside of a densely populated area and is somewhere rural is always going to pay you more money because you're harder to find there. Wow. So just be, have some, help, have some self-awareness, have some humility, understand that it's a partnership, treat it like a partnership. And not only will you find more success, but you'll actually really enjoy the process. Wow. Gary, that, that's some great insight, actually. That's some great insight. Gary, Earl, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. A lot of insightful um, information. Um, I actually took some notes when, when you were talking, so it's very, very good. Um, t tell the listeners how they can contact you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I certainly welcome uh, questions. Uh, criticisms, uh, funny jokes, whatever you got. I, I'm, I'm, I'm an open networker and I love to, to talk and communicate with folks and I'm always looking to learn myself. So uh, best way to reach me um, is uh, first name. So Gary, G-A-R-Y dot Rada, R-A-D as in David, A at N-M. Uh, that's uh, Nancy Megan, N-M dot com. Um, I also provide uh, financial planning and wealth management uh, advice and services as well, uh, specifically targeting folks within the IT infrastructure field. So, um, you know, I, I can provide staffing advice as well as, uh, you know, helping you grow, manage, and protect your, your money that you've worked hard for as well. So, uh, again, that's uh, gary.rata at nm.com. And, uh, you know, send me an email. And uh, if you'd like to have a phone chat or shoot me some texts, I'd be happy to give you my phone number through my email. Okay. Yeah, Gary, I appreciate it. 